Hi, this is Brad Linder with Lilliputing, and this is the Intel Bean Canyon Nook, or NUC, next unit of computing. It's a small form factor computer. It's the latest in a line of devices in this sort of size and shape from Intel. And uh, Nooks tend to measure about four and a half by four and a half inches, and this particular model is two inches tall. That's because there's room under the hood for both a 2.5 inch hard drive or SSD and M2 solid state storage. There are also some shorter versions that are about an inch and a half tall instead of two inches. Those don't have the 2.5 inch drive bay. This is an interesting model because it's uh, part of the Bean Canyon series. It's some of the first models to feature 28 watt processors. Uh, this is a Coffee Lake CPU with Intel Iris Plus 655 graphics, one of the most powerful integrated graphics chips that Intel has released to date as of the time that I'm shooting this video in December 2018. Uh, sales for about 460 does not include memory storage or an operating system at that price, so depending on how you configure it, it could uh, raise the price substantially. Uh, you're looking at probably at least $600 to make it into a usable computer once you outfit it with memory and storage and say uh, Ubuntu or another Linux-based operating system at another $100 or so for Windows. Uh, there are some places where you can buy pre-configured -pre systems that have some memory storage and an operating system, but this is uh, a version that was supplied to me as a kit, which is how Intel has usually sold these. Calling it bare bones doesn't seem quite right because it does have a processor, it does have graphics, it does have internet, it has uh, pretty much everything you need to get started started except the memory storage and operating system. So kit seems like a better word. Uh, upgrading it is pretty easy. You just unscrew these four guys down here and you can get on the insides. Uh, before we do take a look inside though, I'll show you that we've got HDMI, gigabit, ethernet, two USB 3.1 ports, and a USB Type-C slash Thunderbolt port, as well as the power adapter here. Uh, that Thunderbolt port is kind of nice because it allows you to connect a dongle or a dock or something else and leave a lot of the other ports free so you don't have a ton of cables running from it, which is nice when you have a little computer like this. You don't want to necessarily have a whole rat's nest of cables. Uh, Kensington lock, micro SD card slot. Don't have the full-size one, but again, you could use a dock or something. We've got two more USB type uh, uh, A ports. These are USB 3.1 ports, including one for charging, a headset jack, and a power button. And that's pretty much it, other than sort of the ventilation that you see here on the side. Uh, as I mentioned, this model sells for about $460 without memory and storage as of uh, December 2018. There are also some more affordable models that have a slightly less uh, powerful hardware. We've got a Core i5 and a Core i3 version. Both have Iris Plus graphics, but both have uh, so slower clock speeds on the graphics, and uh, they do have substantially lower starting prices. So if you don't necessarily need the fastest version, you can save a little bit of money by going with one of those instead. Uh, as I mentioned, this version was applied to me by Intel for purposes of testing without any memory or storage. Um, but it's pretty easy to just open up and get inside, there we go, so that you can upgrade the storage on your own. It's a little sort of tricky to open this sometimes, but there we go. Uh, so what I'm using here is the same hardware that I actually used to test the Zotac Z-Box CI660 Nano. So if you've checked out the review there, you'll know that Patriot sent me two uh, DDR4 sticks of RAM. So that's a total of 16 gigs. The uh, system can support up to 32 gigabytes. And while there is an M2 SSD slot here, I didn't necessarily have compatible storage, but I had a 2.5 inch uh, Patriot Burst SSD, 240 gigabytes. Uh, that I was able to put in there. So you just sort of slide that in, screw it into place. Uh, you can undo these power cables if it makes it a little bit easier. And I seem to be messing with the thermal paste there. So that's a quick look inside. You can see that you can easily upgrade the memory, the storage. Uh, you've got two storage options in this particular model. The Core i7 version does not come in an, uh, the smaller sort of inch and a half height version. So if you wanted to uh, get the smaller version, you would have to opt for one of the uh, Core i5 or Core i3 models, but you do have that dual storage option here, which is nice, especially if you wanted to use it with something like Intel Optane Storage, which gives you a relatively small capacity, but super fast solid state uh, storage that you can then pair with a hard drive or SSD. Or you can just use it as two, two different SSDs if you wanted to do something like that. Uh, well, it's not a fanless system, we didn't see the fan. It's actually underneath the lid here, and the lid is actually removable, but I'm not going to go through that right now. Um, 
we didn't see a fan, but there is a fan, but it's relatively quiet, which is which is pretty nice. So let's go ahead and turn it on. I'll show you that I've uh, tested it with Windows and Linux. Um, I don't want to make this video too long, so I won't show you all of that, but I do want to show you a couple of basic things about uh, what happens when you turn it on. In terms of performance, you can check out lilliputing.com to find some benchmarks and other details. Uh, this is definitely one of the faster computers that I've tested, particularly uh, probably one of the fastest with integrated graphics. The uh, Intel Iris 655 uh, graphics are comparable. They're maybe not quite as fast as NVIDIA's MX150, but the fact that they're integrated means that it's a little bit more efficient in a lot of ways. So you can plug in a whole bunch of different things like this. Um, it gets a little bit sort of ugly, particularly if you wanted to uh, also plug in something like speakers or headphones, because then you're going to have a cable sort of sticking out of the front. Um, so what I actually found I prefer to do, and it looks like I powered it on by accident, but I'll go ahead and turn on the display, is use a USB dongle if you have one handy. So here's one from uh, Zotouch that I picked up recently. It's got HDMI, uh, Ethernet, headset, and a couple of USB ports, as well as a full-size SD card reader in addition to the micro SD card reader. So it's nice to have those different options. Uh, that you might not necessarily get with just the built-in features. So while there's a decent range of ports, it's kind of nice to be able to just plug everything in with a single cable. Unfortunately, it doesn't charge via that cable, so you'll still need to plug in at least two things. But once I've got everything plugged in this way, now there's only two things sticking out at the back, and you can sort of stuff the rest of them behind your display if you wanted to. So let's take a look at that display, and I'll show you that since it turned on while I wasn't paying attention, what we're actually looking at here is Ubuntu Linux. So I've got a uh, wireless mouse and keyboard here, or wireless mouse and touchpad, that I had already just plugged the dongle in. Let's zoom out a little bit. And I'll show you that it's being a little finicky, I think, probably because of the fact that I switched the plugs while it was powered on and hadn't logged in yet. So let's just change that there. All right, so we've got Ubuntu Linux up and running. Um, I've actually got Ubuntu and Windows 10 both installed on this system. Three, two, one, one, one. Uh, so audio works, wireless works, the wired ethernet obviously works. I've got web browsing. I can open the Ubuntu Software Center and install a whole bunch of different applications. Um, so basically, I haven't had any significant problems using Ubuntu 18.04 on this, and it uh, it basically feels like a computer. Now what I had meant to do was turn it on and show you that I do have both operating systems. So let's go ahead and reboot. And we should see the grub boot menu. Actually, even before we do that, let me see if I can get... Uh, into Intel's Visual BIOS. And apparently I hit the wrong key combination. So F7 took us there. I think F2 is actually what gets us into the BIOS. So as a small system like this, it's, uh, it's something that you could use as a media center PC, as a low profile office computer, as uh, something that you could use for digital signage, uh, put it in the living room and play some games. Um, and it's, uh, it's overall a pretty versatile little machine. Now it's not necessarily the cheapest computer you could get, but it's one of the more powerful compact computers that you can find. And uh, what we're looking at here is Intel's Visual BIOS, which is kind of a nice set of features that allows you to 
have sort of the same controls that you might expect to see from BIOS, but a more user-friendly user interface. Uh, we've got mouse control. We can adjust our video configuration. We can adjust some of our performance and cooling features. Uh, boot order, so if you wanted to install a different operating system from the one that you start out with and so forth, you have all of those options. Or we can just go ahead and uh, exit and then boot into our operating system of choice. Uh, boot isn't necessarily the fastest that I've ever seen on this particular system, but I think that's a combination of sort of the firmware and the uh, operating systems that I've installed. So I've got this dual boot configuration set up on this drive already. So from here, we're sort of taking the extra step because it's gonna boot into the Grub bootloader before it boots into Windows. Uh, under Windows, I've had no real problems using it for some pretty heavy duty multitasking. So I've used this as my work computer on and off, and that involves opening up a Google Chrome with maybe 20 or so browser tabs at once while I write articles, listen to music during uh, using Spotify, edit images and videos uh, using different software. Um, and uh, overall, it's, it's been pretty, pretty up to the task. Again, you can check out some benchmark details at lilliputing.com. It performs pretty favorably uh, compared to something with an entry-level NVIDIA processor. Uh, might not be quite as fast, but it's a 28-watt chip instead of having two different chips. That's um, maybe uh, in similar devices, you might have like a 15-watt Intel processor or a 25-watt uh, chip from NVIDIA for example. Uh, so again, Ubuntu uh, works, Windows works. We don't have any real problems with the hardware being detected. It has no problems getting connected to my network. Um, I'm just gonna run this in the background so that we have something to watch. This is the PC mark. And um, yeah, uh, overall, it's, it's a pretty nice little machine. It's, uh, if you don't care about small and quiet, it's not necessarily the best choice, but if you're looking for something that is specifically going to be in sort of the smaller and more quiet space, uh, this is definitely one of the most powerful versions uh, available so far. So PC Mark is a nice test because it just sort of shows it running through a whole bunch of different activities in the background. So we've got like a video conferencing test here, and then it goes into uh, office editing tests and 3D graphics tests and so forth. And so you can see it, it does fairly well, and you can check out the final score at littlecuting.com. Um, the only computer that I've tested that's faster than this Intel Nook, this Bean Canyon uh, device as it's called, is Lenovo's ThinkPad P1, which is a laptop with uh, a Coffee Lake six core processor, an H series uh, 45 watt CPU, and NVIDIA Quadro P1000 workstation class graphics. Now that system uh, is substantially more expensive. It's a laptop, it's not a, uh, a tiny desktop computer, and it's significantly noisier in terms of fan noise. Um, so it does score a little bit better in a lot of tests and significantly better when it comes to things like graphics tests. I don't spend a lot of time testing high power computers though. So that's the only system that I've actually used that is substantially faster than this. So what you're getting here is sort of laptop style uh, or laptop class hardware. Uh, although there aren't a lot of laptops with the particular chip that is used in this system. And, uh, and laptops these days are pretty powerful. So for general purpose computing, I think that this Nook is definitely a pretty usable computer. It's uh, something that is, I think is definitely worth considering. Oops, sorry, that's being a little bit noisy. Definitely something that's worth considering if you're looking for something that uh, you want to prioritize a small, light, compact, uh, you know, uh, relatively quiet overall other things. You can find fanless systems that are not usually going to be as powerful, but will be maybe a little bit larger and a little bit less powerful. So I think this is a nice compromise between all of those things. Meanwhile, Intel does have more powerful Nook computers with gaming class hardware, but they tend to be larger and again, substantially noisier. So this is sort of a nice compromise between feature sets. Uh, it does have a faster GPU than you'll find on most devices with only integrated graphics, but it's not necessarily meant for gaming, which isn't to say you can't use it for some gaming. Um, I've played some games on it, including the original Darksiders, and no real problem with frame rates. It's just more sort of bleeding edge, more recent games that require more powerful hardware that you might run into difficulties with. So that's the Intel Bean Canyon Nook with a 28 watt processor, uh, and Intel Iris plus graphics. This is Brad Linder with Lilliputing, and you can find more details about this little computer and a whole bunch of other little computers at lilliputing.com.